18-year-old Natalie Holloway vanished on May 30, 2005 in Aruba. Despite an extensive search, she was never found. Now, 18 years later, after all hope was lost, we may finally know what happened to her. Natalie Holloway from Birmingham, Alabama was attending a five-day graduation trip to Aruba in May 2005. She and 124 classmates were accompanied by seven chaperones in this end-of-year high school tradition. Natalie had a bright future ahead of her, having graduated as a top student and landing a full scholarship to the University of Alabama. Little did she know as her plane took off, her dreams were about to be cut short, leaving an 18-year mystery in its wake. On May 26th, the private plane carrying the students arrived at the Queen Beatrix International Airport in Aruba. The students had agreed to stay at the Holiday Inn Resort, located in the northwest region of the island. The festivities began, and the students began excessively partying and drinking, Natalie particularly indulging. They caused such a ruckus that the hotel warned them they would not be allowed back next year. On May 29th, Natalie reportedly went to a casino that was attached to her hotel, named Excelsior Casino. In surveillance footage captured that day, she was spotted sitting next to an unidentified man. Later in the evening, Natalie went to a bar and restaurant called Carlos and Charlie's and was spotted with what appeared to be the same man at the casino. Later, she was seen leaving the establishment with him and two of his friends around midnight. The next morning, Natalie didn't show up with her classmates as they got ready to head to the airport for their return flight back to the U.S. Her concerned friends checked Natalie's room and found her luggage packed and her passport ready. Natalie's mother, Beth Twitty, was notified and arrived in Aruba that same day with her husband and several family friends. The party retraced Natalie's steps back to the Holiday Inn and asked bystanders if they'd seen her. Beth also managed to get hold of the security footage at the casino, and the man in the footage was later identified by hotel employees as 18-year-old Dutch honors student Joran van der Sloot. Beth obtained his details and address from his acquaintances and presented them to the Aruban police. But the start of the official search was slow, as a person had to be missing for 48 hours before a case could be opened. Joran was eventually traced back to his home in Noord, Aruba where he was questioned about Natalie. Initially, he denied knowing who Natalie was, but when confronted with evidence of witness testimony and the surveillance footage, he changed his story. This would only be the first of many changes he would make. He claimed that he had met Natalie at the casino, and she had invited him to go to Carlos and Charlie's. Later that night, Joran and two of his friends, Deepak and Satish Kalpo, drove to the bar and met up with Natalie. Deepak Kalpo was present at Joran's home when he was questioned and corroborated his story. According to both, when Natalie wanted to leave around midnight, she was very drunk and got into their car. It is theorized that Natalie asked the boys to drive her back to her hotel, but according to Joran's later statement, they drove her to the California Lighthouse to see sharks, later dropping her at her hotel around 2 a.m. Joran claimed that Natalie was so inebriated that she stumbled when getting out of the vehicle refusing any assistance. As they pulled away, they alleged that they saw a man dressed as a security guard approaching Natalie. It wasn't long before Joran's account would change. In his first telling of the tale, he neglected to mention the trip to the lighthouse. Despite this omission, Joran and the Calpo brothers were adamant Natalie was still alive the last time they saw her. An official wide-scale search was launched with the first point of location being the beach near Natalie's hotel. Radio announcements were made across the island, calling tourists and Aruban citizens to join in the search. The party began searching the four-and-a-half-kilometer stretch of coastline to the California Lighthouse. The Dutch Marines later joined the search and extended it to include the ocean. But nothing was ever found. And so, more scrutiny was placed on the last people to see Natalie alive, Van der Sloot and the Calpo brothers. Beth Twitty maintained that the three boys knew more than they were admitting to, and on June 9th, after mounting pressure, Aruban police arrested them. During their interrogation while in custody, their story changed once again. This time, they claimed that after visiting the lighthouse, Deepak and Satish left Natalie and Joran alone on the beach, half a mile away from the Holiday Inn. Joran stated that Natalie was drifting in and out of consciousness, and so he decided to leave her there. The Calpo brothers were released from custody after no charges could be brought against them, even though all three had suspiciously changed their stories numerous times. Joran, on the other hand, 
remained in custody in the San Nicolas jail. There were many false leads as the months passed as well as mounting international scrutiny, but every lead turned out to be a dead end. Joran, much to the dismay of Natalie's parents, was also released. Beth Twitty was so enraged by this that she publicly insulted the Aruban police force as well as the Calpo brothers. She was later ordered to make a public apology. It was around this time that a sinister piece of evidence came to light. Deepak Kalpo was caught on tape admitting to having sex with Natalie on the night of her disappearance. The tape was played for Natalie's parents on the Dr. Phil show. But with its release came reports it had been altered or cut. This was proven to be true when Aruban authorities released the full version of the tape, and Deepak is heard saying that she did not have sex with any of them. Once again, the trail went cold. After Joran's release, he found a celebrity-like status and used it to his advantage, giving countless interviews. He manipulated the U.S. media extensively, claiming he had new information every few months. The details he provided were ever-changing. In 2008, despite the Natalie Holloway case being closed, he gave an interview saying that in February 2005, he met a man who wanted a blonde girl in exchange for money. Joran claimed in a Fox News interview that Natalie had been sold into sexual slavery and that he had incriminating audio between him and his father confirming this. He claimed he'd taken Natalie to the beach and handed her over to the man. Soon after the interview, Joran retracted his statement and publicly said he had lied. There was no real evidence to suggest that Joran had sold Natalie to sex traffickers. It's not known why Joran chose to lie. One theory is that he craved attention. The case was officially closed after no new leads were discovered, even though many believed van der Sloot was to blame. There was also some speculation that the Aruban government was involved in the cover-up of the disappearance. Joran would confess once more in 2008 after undercover businessman and dealer Patrick van der Eem befriended Joran and taped him confessing that Natalie had had a seizure and passed away, and that a friend had helped him dump her body in the ocean. In his confession, he referred to Natalie as a whore and a bitch, showing just how little regard he had for her. When this information was publicly released, Joran once again retracted his confession and said he was under the influence of marijuana when he made it. Despite a Reuben officials requesting to obtain an arrest warrant for the confession, a judge denied it. In 2012, Alabama courts legally declared that Natalie Holloway was deceased. It seemed that the case would forever remain unsolved. That is until October 2023, when Joran van der Sloot finally admitted to bludgeoning Natalie to death with a cinder block and dumping her body in the ocean. He claimed that he murdered Natalie when she rejected his sexual advances. Van der Sloot confessed in a proffer letter after being indicted by an Alabama federal court for extorting and defrauding Natalie's family by promising to give them the exact location of her remains in exchange for $250,000. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison for his crimes, to be served concurrently with another offense that had taken place in Peru in 2010. He had confessed in 2012 to the brutal murder of Stephanie Flores after the two got into an altercation. His confession resulted in a 28-year sentence and he was later extradited to the U.S. to face extortion and wire fraud charges. With his confession in Natalie's disappearance, he could now face new charges in Aruba although the statute of limitations has passed. The grim details of Natalie's fate are now unveiled, leaving us haunted by the knowledge of her untimely demise. Yet as we grapple with the shocking truth, a lingering question remains. Will her remains ever be found? The final chapter of Natalie's story may not yet be written, as potential new charges in Aruba loom. We can only hope this time. The true story of what happened to her can finally be laid to rest. The mystery that has tormented her family and the world for nearly two decades may finally be reaching its end, but the echoes of her story will continue to haunt us for years to come.